That's good. Hallelujah. The sun's going to come up because the sun has arisen. Amen. <laughs> Turn please your Bible to the book of Exodus, chapter number 30, please. Exodus 30. Verse number 34. Exodus 30, verse 34. And the Lord, Jehovah, said unto Moses, Take unto thee sweet spices, stacte, and, un and anica, and galbanum, these sweet spices with pure frankincense, of each shall there be a light weight. And thou shalt make it a perfume, a confection, after the art of the apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy. And thou shalt beat some of it very small, and put of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation, where I will meet with thee, it shall be unto thee, or unto you, most holy. And as for the perfume which thou shalt make, ye shall not make to yourselves, according to the composition thereof. It shall be unto thee holy for the Lord. Whosoever shall make like unto that, to smell thereto shall even be cut off from his people. Father, I pray now, Lord, you'd anoint the word as it goes forth. We need the anointing tonight, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. There's an awful lot of people that say that the, you don't need the Old Testament. Uh, certain Christian groups that uh, essentially they just cut it out and say all you need is the New Testament. And... Uh, I, uh, I understand that they're trying to, that in some cases, the Old Testament has been abused in the sense that they try to bring the law into grace, and they try to uh, teach that uh, the church today is nothing in the world more than a branch of Judaism, and uh, you have the Hebrew roots movement and all that going on, uh, full steam ahead. So you've got an issue there. I understand that. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. The Lord Jesus Christ time and time again quoted the Old Testament. And he talked about the Bible being all, he said, not one jot nor one tittle would fail. And it's not going to. We will learn a great deal by searching the scriptures. If you'll remember in the road to the two on the road to Emmaus, the Lord Jesus Christ opened the scriptures to them. And the Bible says their heart burned within them. Well, what scripture did he open? He opened the Old Testament, the Tanakh. He opened it to them. And they, of course, received what it had to say. There's some great truths here in the book of Exodus, as you know, the second book of the Pentateuch, and it's written by Moses about 1,400 years before Christ. But I want you to notice what he's talking about here. He's talking about an oil. He's talking about a particular oil. He's talking about the particular spices that go into that oil. For example, I may mispronounce some of these words. We have English here, but the best way to pronounce it is to get a Hebrew lexicon and look at the etymology of the word. But anyway, what we have in English is stacte. Now this is a, uh, the etymology of this word suggests to drop or to distill, like the dew, which settles only in stillness and quietness. So therefore, this would represent in prayer, patience, issue of patience in prayer. By the way, this oil is oil that was burned and uh, was used in the altar of incense inside the holy place as they approached unto God. Uh, Theonica is the fragrance was obtained by crushing a perfumed mollusk found in the sea. It suggests that being crushed in the presence of God, this would suggest penitence in prayer, to repent. Galbanum, uh, the etymology of the word points to fat or to uprising sap of a plant, that is, to its strength and virility. Therefore, this would refer to praise in prayer. And then, of course, we have frankincense. The word means to be white, reminding us that our petitions must be pure. The tree that yields it grows on bare, inhospitable rocks. Nothing this world has will sustain prayer. This is the petition in prayer. It is utterly impossible for the flesh to produce prayer. Look at verse 32. Genesis, I mean, Exodus 30, verse 32. Upon man's flesh shall it not be poured, neither shall ye make any other like it. Warning, warning again, after the composition of it, it is holy. 
and it shall be holy unto you. The flesh in the Bible is never made holy. Never, never, ever, ever, never. Sometimes you can yield your members as members of righteousness. You can bring them into subjection in service to the Lord, but they will never, ever, ever be holy. Therefore, this holy anointing oil has no place on flesh. It's one of the greatest truths that we can learn is that we learn to differentiate between the profane and the holy. I've said to you so many times before, prayer can be a mechanical thing and fleshly, or it can be holy. It can be of the soul. It can, be, it can originate where it should originate in the heart. I want you to notice something about this in, in Exodus chapter number 30 and verse number 1. Look carefully at what you're reading here now. Exodus chapter 30 and verse 1. Thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon of Shechem wood. Shalt thou make it. Now what is this? This is the altar of incense. All right. Now when you go back to Exodus chapter number 25, so you'll understand the context of what's going on here, you'll notice that all of these uh, pieces that go in the holy place, the Lord gives them instructions even to the Ark of the Covenant. In verse number 10, thou shalt make an ark. And he gives them the directions about what to make and uh, what goes into the holy place. But nothing is said about an altar of incense. And this has come to the attention of a lot of people who read the Bible. Why was it not mentioned in Exodus chapter number 25? Not mentioned at all until you get to Exodus chapter number 30. And then when you get to chapter number 30 in verse number 1, thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon. Now, this is a prayer altar. It's very important to understand. This is not a sacrificial altar where something is burned. The altar outside, the brazen altar, was used to burn the sacrifices brought to the Lord. That was outside. Once an acceptable sacrifice had been presented to the Lord, the priest could enter into the holy place. Once he entered into the holy place, he could approach God. But then there's only one priest that could do that the seventh month, the tenth day of the month. And that's the high priest. And at one time it was Aaron. He was the only one that could continue on behind the veil and stand before the mercy seat and sprinkle blood on the mercy seat, the seat of atonement before God. But before he ever got that close to the Lord, he had to go to the altar of incense. You see, prayer separated him from the presence of God. Now, he had the table of showbread, he had the seven golden candlesticks, he had the sacrifice made outside, but none of that would suffice without prayer. You see, the offering unto God of a Savior for you can only come from your heart. Your heart. He that believeth with heart, with a heart man believeth unto righteousness. The sacrifice has already been made. The brazen altar was satisfied at the cross. We have the seven golden candlesticks, the Holy Spirit, the light lighting the table of showbread. The showbread is Christ. He's the bread of life. All of these things are sufficient absolutely, but you'll never approach God without prayer. And that prayer is so important. And it's so important because from the heart man believeth into righteousness. Prayer originates in the heart. Now here's something important about this. When he told them about the oil to make the composition of the things that you put together to make the oil, this was never to be used for any other purpose than that which it was made for. In other words, you couldn't take it home if you liked the smell of it, you know, and use it in your lodge, your lodging, so forth. You could never do that. You do that at the pain of death. This was holy unto God. Holy means separated unto the Lord. Holy means God owns it. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Jericho, though it was a filthy, rebellious town, was still holy to the Lord. When Achan took of that goodly Babylonian garment and wedge of gold, it wasn't because there was some great virtue about Jericho. It was because God owned it. And he violated the holiness of God. You see, God is a sovereign God. And he owns all things. And for a while, he's allowed Satan to run wild on this earth. But he, he keeps him in check because the Holy Spirit is here and will only let Satan go, far, go so far so fast. He that letteth will let till he be taken out of the way. What you're seeing now, and I've often wondered about this, is if we are watching a gradual removal of the Holy Spirit, 
allowing wickedness now to just flow like a, like a broken dam, just flow right through the floodgates. It's almost like it's all flooding right into your soul. Have you noticed that? And I've never seen it, never expected in my lifetime to see what I've seen in this country and around the world. But holiness is unto the Lord. Holy, holy, holy. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's what the cherubim cried out in the book of Revelation 4 and 5. Because they were before the Lord, they cried, holy, holy, holy. Now this oil was unique in that it was only to be offered unto God. It was created for God. It was for God to smell. It was for God to receive. It represented prayer. Now there's something about prayer that is unique to every one of us. Very unique. In plain words, let me put it this way to you. I can pray for you, but I can't pray through you. I can't pray into you and for you through you, right? I can't do that. I can pray for you. That's called intercessory prayer. And we should do that. We're commissioned to do that. We're called upon to do that. Pray one for another that you may be healed and so forth. We should be praying for each other constantly. And the closer we get to the Lord, the more burden we'll have for each other in fellowship with God. And we'll pray. Remember, angels do not fellowship with God. The reason they do not fellowship with God is because they are not a tripart being like you are. You are a being that was made in the image of God. That gives you access to something an angel has no access to. Nowhere in the Bible does it say an angel prays. When you get home, look it up. You won't find it. And there's a lot of other things that angels cannot do. And if you'll remember last Sunday I, when I was preaching to you, I told you how. In the book of Hebrews it says, God hath not put the world to come in subjection to the angels, but to you. <laughs> the world to come will be yours, not the angels. But now, I cannot pray through you, but I can pray for you. This means that your prayer cannot be my prayer. Your prayer is your prayer. Your prayer originates in your soul. It comes from the inside of you. It's what makes you who you are. It's your identity before God. And let me say this while I'm saying it. You can say things to God that you should never say to each other. It's very important. There are things that you can say to God and you should say them to him. Because once you begin to learn what, it's really, what prayer is really about, you're going to start clearing yourself. You're going to start emptying your soul before the Lord. Hold nothing back, folks. You know, we have a tendency, we have a, we have a, we have a, we have a deceptive nature, and we think, we think if we hem-haw around around it, about it, God's not going to see it. And you know, that's stupid, isn't it? Isn't that foolish? The eyes of the Lord run to and fro, beholding the evil and the good. There's nothing you can hide from the Lord. But, but, when, you, but, but, but when, you, when you open up your heart to God, talk to him like you would never talk to a human being. He'll never throw it back in your face. He'll never drag it before you. He'll never beat you over the head with it. Now, we cannot pray through each other, but we can pray for each other. But there is one who can pray through you. That's the Holy Ghost. In Romans chapter number 8, the Bible said he knows the will of God and he prays according to the will of God with groanings that cannot be uttered. He prays through you, for you, into the presence of God that your prayer may be acceptable to God. Sometimes you don't understand what's going on and you don't need to understand. Listen, you don't have to have a THD in theology to draw nigh to God. <laughs> As a matter of fact, there's an awful lot of them out there that that becomes an encumbrance to them. <laughs> and I'm certainly not against scholarship. Learn as much as you can. Lord knows we need to know. But the fact of the matter is when you fill your head full of facts, your heart is empty. You're not going to approach God with that. God's not impressed with any of us. But I want you to notice something about this. This is important. That is that only the Holy Spirit can pray through you, for you, into the presence of God and carry you into the presence of God. Now I want you to notice what it says over here in chapter number uh, 30 of Exodus. Look carefully. And verse number 32 again. Upon man's flesh shall it not be poured. Neither shall you make any other like it. After the composition of it, it is holy, and it shall be holy to you. Now, it's a separate study altogether. 
The word most commonly used, translated flesh in the New Testament is sarkos. And uh, soma is another word for flesh. It's the body. You ever heard of anything that is psychosomatic? How many ever heard that term? All right. What's that mean? That simply means that they took two Greek, two Greek words, tsuke, which is soul, soma, which is body, therefore the soul ru ruling over the body, psychosomatic. In plainer words, you're having symptoms, but you don't have any real presence of a germ or anything like that. That's psychosomatic. Uh, bottom line is that's a, that's a nice way of saying you're a nutball. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we, can, we can get around that and move on. <laughs> Uh, you know, you sometimes uh, uh, use a little, uh, a little patience when you're talking to people. Anyway, uh, the flesh. Look at this now. Upon man's flesh shall it not be poured. But how did they anoint the high priest? Did they not take the oil and pour it over his head? Yes, they did. And it ran down his head and dripped off of his beard. That oil was poured on the top of his head and ran down. But that's not his flesh. You see, he's a type of the body of Christ. And folks, believe it or not, I'm not the head of the church. Who is the head of the church? That's exactly right. The anointing went upon him, and from him has flowed down to us. And the anointing we have tonight is the anointing that God gave his son. Amen. Amen. This is why, I look back in John chapter number 20. What I have is what he gave me. John chapter number 20. Verse 22. Look at verse 13. Mary Magdalene, out of whom seven demons, devils had been cast, came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord. Hallelujah to God. Then, in verse number 19... The same day at evening, being the first day of the week, there seems to be an association with so many things now after the resurrection of Christ with which day? First. Exactly, first day. You say, well, I know folks that worship on the Sabbath. That's fine. There's nothing wrong. You'll, you cannot criticize someone for worshiping on the Sabbath. One man esteemeth one day above another. All right. But when he tells me that I, am, I have the mark of the beast, because I'm worshiping on Sunday, he's way out of line. Way out of line. Well, you say you're not supposed to worship on Sunday. Who told you you shouldn't be worshiping on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? We're the backslidden crowd. The first church worshiped every day of the week. Next time this fellow jumps on you for not worshiping on the Sabbath, you say back to him, wait a minute. They met every day, daily from house to house. They break bread, right? Well, of course they did. Every day of the week. But there's something special about the first day of the week. Something special about it. Which day is it then? You start with, uh, you start with Sunday. All right. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. What day is Saturday? It's, what? It's the Sabbath, right. But in number, what day is it? It's what? All right. Now, what day is Sunday? If you've, you've got seven, what follows? Eight. Eight is the number of new beginnings. See? You take Jesus, that's the Lord's name in Greek. Jesus, all right? It's a Greek word. Greek words have gematria, the letters, Aleph, I mean, not, I'm in Hebrew. <laughs> Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. You take that letter, every letter has a numerical value. Alpha, one, beta, two, and so forth. All right? You take the letters of Jesus and add them up, and you come up with this. Eight, eight. Eight. All right. So his number is eight, eight, eight. Now that's not that's not an arbitrary thing. That's not arbitrary. Same with Hebrew. The Romans, Latin. What did they use? They used Roman numerals, didn't they? Okay. So what do we use? We use Arabics. All right. So you have Jesus eight, eight, eight. So they were meeting on the eighth day or the first day of a new beginning. Right. That's what it is. The new beginning. Sunday is the first day of the week, a new beginning. And so the Bible says here, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the, disciples were shut, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus, stood in the midst, saith unto them, Peace be unto you. 
And when he had so said, he showed to them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you as my Father hath sent me. All right. What does Siloam mean? Exactly. What is an apostle? That's it. It's the Greek word apostello. All right. It means to be sent. That's what a sent one is. Now, all of us in here tonight are disciples. If you're a believer, if you're a learner and a follower, you're a disciple of the Lord. We're disciples of Christ. There's a denomination called that, you know. And all of these terms that denominations use, that's fine, that's well and good, but they don't own them. <laughs> I call this the church of God. Why? Because Acts tw chapter 20, verse 28 said, feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Are you the church of God? Are we part of the churches of Christ? Yes. Absolutely. Are we disciples of Christ? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. They don't, nobody owns any, any, any particular term. But here's what's important about this. As the Father hath sent me, in plainer words, the Lord Jesus Christ was the apostle of God. As he hath sent me, even so send I you. He is calling them apostles right here, and he's sending them forth. And then, of course, you've seen this so many times. When he said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. The Lord Jesus Christ was able to give forth the Holy Spirit because he had been commissioned to give the Holy Spirit because of what he had accomplished in the presence of God. And God the Father did not withhold the Holy Spirit from him in any measure. And therefore now he's able to commission his people, his saints, with the Holy Spirit of God. That's what this is. This is a commissioning. This is an endowment with power. This is a specific calling. Now the day of Pentecost, which follows a little while later, in Acts chapter number 2, they received power that day also. But they received it as a collective body. The church of the living God was born spiritually in Acts chapter number 2 by the coming of the Holy Ghost down upon all of them as a collective body. That's important. Very important. Very important. I want you to look at something else over here. Look at the book of Acts. I think it's about 19 somewhere. Yeah, it is. Acts 19, verse, verse 1. Now, this is important. Look at this. Acts chapter number 19 and verse 1. It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, all right, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Now hold on a minute. Just a minute. Did not John the Baptist say, I baptize with water, but there's one coming after me whose shoes la shoe latchet I'm not worthy to un untie or unloose, and he shall baptize you with what? Holy Ghost and fire. fire. We've got something wrong here, right? It's not wrong in the scripture, but it's wrong in what they had heard. You see, you're going through a transition period. You're going through, this is why he asked them this. Have you received the Holy Ghost? You're disciples. Who are you disciples of? Who are you learners of? Who are you following? They said, well, we, we, you know, we must be follow verse 3. We're unto John's baptism. Yes, but you only got part of it. They left out a very important part. He'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. See what happens? But can you also see how the Holy Spirit is pulling his church together and he's pulling in the peripheral, the folks out here that are just getting part of the message, and he's bringing them right back to square one. And, of course, square one is the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse number four. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him that is on Jesus Christ, or on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, remember, receive ye the Holy Ghost. All right? Receive ye the Holy Ghost. When he laid hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. What happened here? God's proving once again that the Apostle Paul is one of his chosen apostles 
anointed from on high, and he could pass the Holy Spirit down upon them at that time, and they received him. The Holy Spirit, folks, is absolutely necessary for our life. We're dead without him. We can have the greatest organization, be the prettiest bunch, smell good, look good, talk good, walk good. We can have everything, all our ducks in a row, but without the Holy Spirit, we're twice dead and plucked up by the roots. Why? Because it's all man-made flesh, and there's no power in it. There's no power at all in it. So when you go back to Exodus chapter number 30 and verse number 32, upon man's flesh shall it not be poured. And so he wasn't. No way. Well, preacher, how can I be filled with the Holy Spirit? Same way you got saved. Are you born again? Did you know that some Christians, after their initial experience of salvation, how many of you remember what that was like? <laughs> that doesn't happen every day, right? I mean, I'm, I floated for two weeks. And I, at that time, I was a professional mechanic. It's a wonder I didn't get messed up big time. <laughs> sure did. I had an old boy. I was upstairs, and downstairs was the body shop. And I went down there, and we'd go to eat lunch today, together every day. And that's all we did was talk about the Lord for an hour. And we'd invite other people to go with us. Would you like to go eat lunch with us? Would you like to go over here? No, we can't go today. <laughs> you want to get away from these nutballs? <laughs> they, all they want to do is talk about the Lord. <laughs> but we did. We enjoyed it. Now, finally, two or three of us would be going, and we had a good time. We talked about Lord, the, uh, the Lord. And, uh, and uh, that's the way it was when I first got saved. But you kind of get uh, dull. And you kind of get drugged down, wore down. With, with life, don't you? Uh, I heard Johnny Erickson Tata. I learned about her. I hadn't been saved too long, but I found out about Johnny. How many, how many know who I'm talking about? Uh, I forget where it was. Maybe I heard her on radio or somewhere. But anyway, uh, I saw a book. I know what it was. I remember that was a book. She was on the cover of that book, and she had a paint brush in her mouth, and she was painting. And at that time, she was a quadriplegic. I think she has now some kind of a, a prosthetic to where she can move a little bit of her arms, but she's still paralyzed in her legs. Well, she dove off of a cliff into the water and hit a rock, and they took her to the hospital, and they told her she'd never walk again, gave her terrible news, and I'm talking about a teenager, gave her terrible news, never walk again. She said, yes, I will. And she had strong constitution. Yes, I will, she said. And so she came out of there and she started reading scriptures and claiming them, claiming healing from God and claiming the promises of the Lord. Well, that didn't change anything. Then she'd go to the church services where they had healing lines and she'd get in the healing line. All right, there's nothing wrong with asking God to heal you. If there's something wrong with you, I'd go to him before I'd go to anybody else. Amen. She got in the healing line. And uh, people got around her that encouraged her and told her that if she'd have enough faith that she'd be healed. So she really, she really put, her, put her spirit into it, her soul into it. I mean, she did everything. I'm sure that just as sincere and genuine as anybody could possibly be, but she wasn't healed. This went on for quite a while. She didn't give up easily, and I don't blame her. I wouldn't either, would you? The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So time and time and time and time again, she went before the Lord, claimed his promises, asked for healing, and uh, declared, pronounced herself healed, and, you know, all the things that go with it. It's not being critical. It's being observant. Never was healed. So the day came when she accepted the fact that God was not going to heal her. She was going to remain a quadriplegic for the rest of her life. That was a hard day, she said. That was a hard day when she accepted that fact. She had felt time and again that God had forsaken her. God was nowhere to be found. Heavens were brass. God didn't hear her prayers. Then the Spirit started speaking to her through his word. God began to comfort her spirit and her soul and began to show her some great truths in the Bible that you can only learn when you're like her, when you're in a situation like that. She began to grow from that slowly. She started accepting the will of God. 
And it started producing something inside Johnny that wasn't there. She began to mature. And she started helping other people that were watching her. And she began to see things, spiritual truths, and the way God would work in the lives of people. And she knew that God was using her. He was really using her. And he's continued to use her. And that woman has been an inspiration to me time and again. She'll probably never know it in this world, but I'll meet her one day. I'll go around whining and down in the dumps and the blues and Satan's beating me to death. And I was the greatest thing in the world one day and now here I am, Judas Iscariot the next. And I'll hear her. And I'll think to myself, I got nothing to be bawling and crying about. Look at that woman. Look at what she's gone through all of her life. I remember one case in point. She'd been to a meeting. She uh, uh, was leaving the meeting and going out to the car. And something happened that got her wheels caught and flipped her over. And she flipped straight out of her, of her wheelchair straight forward and her face buried right down into the concrete. Just skint the whole side of her face. Just a, a terrible thing. And she was laying in that and it was raining and the rain was coming down on the back of her head and the blood was floating from her face. And there she was falling out of that wheelchair. And she said a song came to her heart and God began to bless her and comfort her and move in her soul and her spirit. And she came out of that thing stronger in the Lord than she was when she went into it. God doesn't promise us that he's going to heal everything and, and everything's going to work out just fine. And, and I know there's a lot of preachers out there preaching that stuff. But I've been pastoring for 42 years nearly. I've seen people go down through the valley of the shadow of death and come out of it. And I've seen people go down through the valley of shadow of death, and they didn't. It hadn't been that long ago that I got a phone call at 4 o'clock in the morning. I was sitting on the sofa. I'm up at 2, 3, 4. And the phone rang. I answered it, and it was Emmanuel May Mahan. He said, Preacher, she just passed away. So I went over to St. Mary's Hospital, walked down the aisle, walked by the nurse's station, walked right up to the door, and opened it and walked in. Those nurses back there, they, they got upset because they don't want you walking into a room like that. But I walked in there because I've been in those rooms many times, many times. And there, there she lay. There was her body, you know, there she lay, fixed in death. She wasn't covered. Her body was just lying there, 4 o'clock in the morning. Sharon. I'd known her a long time. Now she's gone. We had prayer, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God. I felt him in that room. Barry McDonald, her brother, came in a little while after that. Barry came in. And when he saw his sister, sister's body there, you know, it just blew him away. Terrible thing. Terrible. That's part of life. But I walked out of that room that morning, and so did Barry, and so did Emmanuel. We all walked out of that room knowing one thing's for certain. I am the resurrection and the life. He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. I said, Sharon, I'll see you again. You're not here. That's not you. That's an empty shell. I'll see you again. I'll meet you by the river. And I walked out. And we carried a little body up here in Sevier County. There's a little graveyard up there. Most, most people around here have no idea where it is. We carried her little body up there and we buried it in that graveyard and, and we walked away and I said again, I'll see you, Sharon. See you again. Amen. Just be a little while. See you again. You have no more need of this earthly house or this tabernacle. That's the difference between the holy and the profane. The holy says, Lord, you're the Lord God. In you we live, we move, we have our being. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I know whom I have believed. 
The profane is to look at the body, the temporal tabernacle, and to say, oh me, what am I going to do now? They're gone, you see. And to feel that overwhelming flood of sorrow and pain. And boy, does it ever come. The Bible said, I, for those who sorrow, who have no hope. And man, we have a world full of people who have. I have been to funerals where people were staggering drunk. And the reason they were is because the only way they could handle that daddy or that mama or a husband or a wife gets so drunk they couldn't stand up because they wanted somehow or another that would get them out of the reality. That's the difference between the profane and the holy. I know whom I have believed. Amen. Holy sees the unseeable. Holy knows the unknowable. Holy refuses to believe what its eye sees but accepts what God promised and what his word says. Holy is able to look beyond the present into the eternity, the eternal world. Hallelujah to God. Amen. Father, I pray you bless your word tonight. Bless my brothers and my sisters. Heavenly Father, tonight, Lord, help us understand the difference between the holy and the temporal, the holy and the profane. And Lord, to understand this great truth about prayer, Father. It's our prayer. It's my prayer, not their prayer. They can pray for me, but they can't pray through me. In Jesus' name.